Aloha, which means a lot of happy alcoholics. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking uh, Bill and Tom uh, for having me come to share my experience at home and uh, at this meeting. And I can't believe Boca Raton. That was the last meeting I actually spoke uh, right, it was last meeting, and wow, we were hanging on there waiting for a cruise. But anyway, uh, we're back here in Hawaii, and um, what can I say? Life on God's terms, I like to say. And um, um, I'm still living the dream. It's, it's a little different, but I'm living the dream. And... Uh, and here I, can, I have this man that's here with me, and I've been with this man for 40 years. I can't believe the same man, 40 years. And anyway, I said to him, uh, I said, we've been, married, we've been sober now uh, 38 years. I said, so what is it that you appreciate the most about me? I said, is it my natural beauty? Is it my vivacious personality? Or is it my ravishing body? You know, he said, what I appreciate the most about you is your unlimited imagination. I tell you. But that's okay. I tell you, um, and both of us suffered from the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction. And, um, I have no regrets. And it was only seven years. I picked up at 32. 32 years old. Someone said to me, Norman G, what kind of old new fool was you to pick up and start drinking and using at 32? I said, don't call me old. I said, old is when your best friend, your best friend compliments you on your alligator shoes when you only barefooted. Don't call me old. I, you know, a lot of people could, I mean, not you, Norman Jean, why would you pick up and start drinking? And, um, I, I, you know, something, I know something today on why I picked up. Because I was just like everyone else, kicked out the garden. And, uh, so I was running on self-will. I did. I didn't have a clue. So I, you know, I, but I have no regrets about those seven years of drinking. But when I picked up that night at 32 years old, evil stepped up inside me. And I knew I was going, I knew I was going into the abyss. Didn't take no, it didn't take no time at all for me to understand one thing. I made a choice. And guess what, you guys? My life had fallen into the abyss of hopelessness and uselessness and worthlessness, helplessness and haplessness. And my existence was based on nothing but regret, remorse, ruin, and righteous living. I was snake fed by the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction. And that venom, it poisoned my body and my soul and my spirit. This is a threefold disease. And uh, I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't stop. And, you know, I, and I couldn't believe how so progressive it was. That's why I tell people today, I said, what keeps me in the rooms coming up 31, coming up on 31 years is that progression. I think about that progression. I get out of treatment, within 24 hours, I'll pick up again. And that progression will take me further out on that dark side of the universe. That is what keeps me in the rooms. And also what keeps me in the rooms is power. The power of God. So, like I said, the newcomers, if you don't think your life can get worse, you don't have an imagination. You don't. That progression, it took me so far out, and I couldn't stop it. I could not stop that screaming demon that was in my head. And um, I am, ooh. So my third 
her treatment. And my husband said to me, he said, babe, you're going to have to get it this time. This is the last treatment. And I, I cannot let you take me all the way down to. So I hope and pray that you get it this time. That's what he said. And I said to myself, wow. Because I had this spiritual thirst I could not quench. I had a spiritual hunger that I could not feed. I had this bio cycle spiritual disease that I could not heal. I was snake bit by the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction. And that venom, it poisoned me. I was poisoned. And um, so, you know, I, I all I have to say is the house went into foreclosure five times behind my drinking. And this man, he loved me. He loved me unconditionally. He did. He loved me when he didn't have to love me. He was kind to me when he didn't have to be kind to me. And he forgave me. Um, and But I, I just couldn't stop. And I want to stop. I was not one of those happy alcoholics out there. Drug, I was not at all. Because I knew I was going against the grain. And my mind was so insane. So I even tried to get some life insurance, more life insurance on my life. Because I was I was gonna take myself out. I was, you know, I was gonna just I just figured I was just gonna just mm, just drink myself, drug myself to death. But um, I wanted like more life insurance because I told my husband, I said, uh, I said, well. One thing, if I die, you need to have, you have double, double the amount of insurance. Uh, you you benefit from that. But anyway, you guys, um, I met this man. I never forget when I met him. I met him before I became an alcoholic, and uh, he came in at at Cal State Fullerton University. Here I was working there, and when he walked in the office. I took one look at him. I said, that's a real nice man. So he came back the next day to finish up fixing the copy machine. And he asked me out to lunch. So I went to lunch and came back and I picked up the phone and I called my brother. And I said to my brother, I said, I have found my husband. Yeah. That's what he did, just like you laughing. He started laughing. He said, wait a minute, you, you just met him. I said, shut up. I have found my husband. He said, what you mean you found your husband? He said, but you're still married. I said, shut up. I, was, I told you I'm going to get rid of that coat to Kente. I have found my husband. So through a series of events, I divorced on a Monday and remarried that following Saturday because I had found my husband. I did not let no grass grow around my feet. I've always been one. I've always all my life been a mover and a shaker. I was born in Daytona Beach, Florida, and two months later, my parents moved to Connecticut. And at 23, I picked up the map of the United States, and uh, I said, where's the farthest point? from Connecticut, and I drove across America, not knowing a soul, because I just wanted to get away from those church people. I was the outcast, troublemaker, I was the heathen in the family, I was the white sheep, because I didn't like church, and I didn't like church people. So anyway, no offense, but this is where I was at that time, and um, Anyway, you guys, so I was in California, and then I, I, you know, I ran into this man. And so now we're coming up on uh, 30, 40 years, 40 years being married. You guys, through it all, he hung in there with me. Who's this calling me? Jeez. Uh, wow. Tell it, tell it. So anyway, um. I'm going to room and tell them where we are. So anyway, you guys, I'm just so grateful that uh, all my experiences, I have no regrets, none. 
you because the greatest tra tragedy is not death. The greatest tragedy is regrets. Big book says we shall not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. So when I was in that treatment, the last treatment center, I walked up in thirty thousand dollar treatment, and they, as soon as I got up in that that uh, the hospital, just before I got there, I stopped over. I got me one more. You can relate to that. I got one more. And so Curtis said, "Not he didn't say anything. He didn't say not one thing. He let me go and get my one more." And then 20 minutes later, here I was sitting on a $30,000 treatment bed. And when I got there, they ran straight to the cabinet and they pulled out these pills. They said, you must, you got to take these pills. You're high as a kite. You know, I told them, I looked at the pills. I looked at them. I looked at the pills. I said, I come here to get off of value. I come here to get off of alcohol. And I come here to get off of cocaine. Not this time and then they pulled out a pad Bob and they start writing you ain't nothing but a troublemaker and you just got here I said like I said not this time and then they assigned me a room all the way to the back the back of the bus and this was the first time I had a room to myself and before, I used to have a room with someone else. But guess who would be the one that would sneak out of the hospital and get caught? Moi, me. But this time, it was different. And that's when I sat down on that $30,000 treatment bed. So the question is, you probably heard me share this. How did that jackass, this is not the question, how did that jackass fall off in the ditch? The question is, how did that jackass get up and out of the ditch? I was a jackass that was down in that ditch. And when I surrendered in treatment, I was 90 pounds. I looked like tails from the crib. 90 pounds, I looked like a toothpick with lips. And uh, I, hey, I was beat up from the feet up. And guess what? And I was in fourth place, Miss Connecticut. But you, I was unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. And so I reached way on down in my soul, in my spirit. On that bed, I said, God, you heal me or you kill me. You give me liberty or you give me death. I can't, I can't, I can't take this no longer. I can no longer destroy my life and destroy my my husband. I just cannot no longer live like this. Please do something with me right now. I came from here, Bob. I came from here. I had a spiritual experience. I couldn't see him, but God supernaturally, he loved me. I was mugged in treatment. Can you imagine being... I couldn't see him. I said, whoa. And it's like he slapped that screaming demon, pow, right out of my head. And from that day to this day, it has never, ever returned. It has not even, it has not even tempted me, regardless of what experiences we've gone through, the good, the bad, and the and the ugly doesn't matter. It didn't. It never came back, and I never. Even, I was never even threatened with it, and all because of having had a spiritual awakening. As a result of these steps, has placed a new DNA, which is nothing but a group of principles, spiritual in nature, and has been practiced as a way of life. And has expelled the, the obsession to drink and has given me the ability to live life useful and wholesome. So I'm just grateful to be here to share about how this program really works for me. 
So when I came home from treatment, I walked in that house. I, before I left treatment, I had a, I don't know if anyone else here has ever had a silkworm. Not the same man, but in a different time zone, a different man. He said to me, Norman Jean, if you never drink, if you never use again, he said, you, you're going to light up the world. That's what he said to me. I said, light up the world. I hope I don't drink and light up a crack pipe. Are you serious? He said, Norman Jean, hear me out. If you never drink or you never use again, you're going to light up the world. He said, because a star has been born. I said, no, you didn't say that, did you? He said, yes, look at me. I said, I want you to tell me one thing. How to keep the screaming demon out of my head? He said, uh, he gave me a big book. And he said, guess what? It was $50,000 all, all the other treatment centers. This one was 30. And he said, you don't have to pay anything, the 30,000. You don't have to pay nothing back. He said, all you do once you leave here is go out and light up the world. He said, and the solution is in the fellowship, the, in the big book, and it's in the fellowship. And he gave me a schedule. I walked out of treatment to never look back. And I walked out to never look back. I looked down in that hole. It was deeper and it was steeper. And I knew that I would never return. So, and it says in the big book, permanent recovery seven times, you guys. So I walked in my first AA meeting or oh, before I got there. I went home and I said to my husband, I said, Curtis, you're going to have to get right or get left. I said, you're the best man I've ever known in this life. But you're going to have to get right or get left. I said, I have another run, but I don't have another recovery. So you make a decision what you're going to have to do. Get right or get left. You know what he said to me? I worked like a slave. <laughs> get that house out of foreclosure. You wrecked not one car, but two cars at one time. And I've done everything I could to try to keep us aboard. And you're going to tell me to get right or get left? I said, Curtis, I have another run, but I don't have another recovery. I said, I have to cross over. I have to live all 12 of these steps in order for that screaming demon to stay out of my head. Because I asked Silkworth, I said, what will it take to keep it out of my head? You know, his name was Joe Brady. But I call him Silkworth. I said, well, I didn't say, what will it take for me not to drink? I said, what will it take to keep that demon out of my head? He said, here's the book. The solution is in the book. And go to your fellowship. So, Curtis said to me three months, three months after I told him to get right or get left, you know what he said to me? Quote, whatever you're doing, just don't be me behind. That's what he said. Well, that's what he said. I said, well, here are the steps that we took. Because I didn't want to go in that fourth dimension by myself. I wanted him to go with me. And so like, anyway, you guys, so we've been on this journey. We've been on this journey now for, um, you know what? Like I said, coming up on how many years? 40 years married, but 38 years, no, 31 years sober and clean. 31 years sober and clean. So I'm grateful to be here. So I want to talk about a few things about the fourth dimension. And um, when I say recovered, that means I'm wholesome. That means I have, I am cured. I don't know why Bill Wilson put in there, uh, we never cured. And once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. I've talked to him. I consider him my sponsor. I talked to him in the Fellowship of the Spirit. I said, 
spilled, I don't know why you put that in the book. Because what it does, it gives an alcoholic an excuse not to grow. You know, an excuse is nothing but a crutch for the uncommitted. Excuses is the graveyard for opportunity. I said, I don't know why, because I've seen, I heard so many people say, uh, we never cure it. I can't believe it. But see, because I was struck sober miraculously, and I was healed, cured instantaneously. And I recovered supernaturally. And I'm rich, rich, rich spiritually. And I will live, live forever, eternally. If I drop dead right now, Bob, well, it would be an unusual meeting. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> if I drop, if I fall over right now. <laughs> I, I said that in the meeting in Burbank. If I drop dead right now, and they start laughing. I said the same thing. If I dropped it, and they just kept right on laughing. They wouldn't stop laughing. Then I said, did somebody drop the air behind this podium? Somebody said, yeah, last week. I said, oh, no. <laughs> they had a speaker. It dropped there behind the podium, you guys. And then I called, oh, no. Then I said right there, there, yeah, no, 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 no time. I'm not a fearful of death, you guys. But I said, Lord, I do not want to go no time soon. I'm having too much fun with my life. So anyway, uh, I'm so grateful to know to live eternally. And it says in the big book, in dying, we awaken to eternal life. You know? So, like, you know, you guys, if I drop down on this on this podium right now, not on the podium, but on this laptop right now, all I'm going to do is take off this chocolate soup. You say nothing but an earth soup. It's all it is. It's all it is. So you shake it off. And I'm just... My spirits are going to take my soul into another world to carry this message of recovery, unity, and service. Amen. All three legacies. One cannot exist without the other. The body, soul, and the spirit, one cannot exist without the other. Light, heat, and air, one cannot exist without the other. Mole, Larry, and Curly, one cannot exist without the other. Recovery, unity, and service, one cannot exist without the other. So, all I have to say is, I'd rather know a few things for sure than be confused about a whole lot of things. What I do know is that this program, it works. It works in spite of me. It works in spite of you and countless others. Because what it did, it took a nobody and turned me into somebody that's willing to share with anybody about the recovered mind and body. I have recovered. And and the word recovered is mentioned how many times? Over 17 times in the big book. And the word powerless is mentioned one time in the steps. But the word power is mentioned 67 times in the big book. As we felt new power flow in, we have recovered and given the power to help others, knowledge of his will, and the power to carry it out came to believe that this power could restore us to sanity. Once a mind has been stretched into a new idea, that mind will refuse to return to its original dimension. Because a mind that is imbued with absolute truth is a mind of restoration, revelation, and regeneration. Show me a person who claims to be recovered but shows no immeasurable difference in his behavior is a person that is walking in Delusions. Delusions. Because information without application is hallucination. <laughs> I was tired of walking around in hallucination. <laughs> so anyway, the word power. Power conceives nothing without a command. And I was willing to go to any lengths to do the necessary steps to not drink forever. Forever. And the word forever is five times in a big book. And, um, and permanent recovery, I mentioned that, is seven times in the big book. So anyway, you guys, so my big book is like my 357, Smith and Wilson. So just go ahead and make my day. <laughs> the big book is the Bible in drag. That's what it is. It's the Bible in drag. <laughs> the second so 
old book in the world, and the big book, I always say, if you ever want to hide something from an alcoholic, just stick it in the big book. You know what I'm saying? You'll, you'll never find it. So I'm grateful, you guys. I've always had my big book. When I walk into meetings, for 31 years coming up on, I've always had my 357 Smith & Wilson. And uh, I tell you, I have enjoyed my life in spite of this man that's had eight major heart attacks. Do you believe that? I, he was just in the hospital this, this past week. He went to the hospital. And we only been in Hawaii now three weeks now, four weeks, four weeks. He's been in the hospital twice. I said, Curtis, you going to live or you going to die? I need to know. Yeah. So I can PMS, pack my stuff. <laughs> anyway, you guys, no, but you know something? God gave me an insurance that he's going to be okay. He just have to go. He's going through. It was, and the, the, the family curse. Mama had a heart attack. Daddy had a heart attack. Brother had a, his brother had dropped dead back in the church. And um, so anyway, you guys, I'm glad that he's still here. And and he said, I'll tell you in a minute. He, I, he won't share, I, you know, when they open up. Uh, the reason why he's still here. And when you, you, when you find the will of God, you live longer. So anyway, my father, a week ago, a week ago, 10 years ago, I said to him, I said, Dad, God told me to tell you something, you and Mom both. I said, God told me to tell you and Mom to get saved. And you know what he said to me? I dare you say something like that to me, to get saved. I've been saved, and I've been a minister three times to three different churches. You going to tell me to get saved? I said, Dad, no evidence. I said, you and Mom been fighting like two pit bulls in a blind back alley for 62 years. That's a long time to be fighting. I said, I'm not a God told me to tell you person, but he told me to tell you to get saved. And two months after I told him to get saved, there he was in Georgia, caught on camera. And I was in Florida at an AA meeting. And he was singing this song. I want to thank of his goodness, what he's done for me. He died on Calvary and set me free in front of 300 people. He was short off. He was in his glory. I want to dance, 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 dance all night. And he had his white suit on, had that microphone. And he came back to the board and said, I want to thank of his goodness, what he's done for me. And he said, I'm saved. And he dropped dead. Bob, right behind the podium, he dropped dead. Yes. Here I'm in a meeting now. This is what you call synchronicity. No one that got the call. I was the first one that got the call. But before, I was in the meeting. And the topic was death. How do you stay sober when the loss of a loved one go? What does it take for you to stay sober when you, uh, the, the loss of a loved one? And I mean, of all topics, my father's dead on the floor. I'm not knowing it at the time. I was the first one that got the call though. But I started sharing about death. I said, death is not a fault that we have to fight. Death is a fact that we all have to face. No one gets out of life without dying. Statistics tells me that one out of one die. Woody Allen said that he's not fearful of dying. He just don't want to be around when it happens. <laughs> and Dustin Hoffman says what he wants written on his epitaph quote, I knew this would happen. So what I want written on my epitaph now, my father's dead on the floor. I'm not knowing that he's gone now. I said, what I want written on my epitaph is that Norma Jean, she lived, she loved, she laughed, and she left. Hello and a goodbye, no regrets. It's time for me to go. I want to drop dead behind a podium. Hmm. Not knowing my dad has just dropped dead behind a podium. 10 minutes before I start sharing. So now I was the one that got, because I was the only one that had a relationship with my father. And that's the reason why. So when we got to Connecticut, 
guess what? 800 people showed up at the funeral in Darien, Connecticut. Congressman Hines, senator, the senator, what was his name? I could not believe the dignitaries that showed up at my daddy's funeral. I said, that's Jerry Springer, daddy. I call you Scott, Jerry Springer, daddy. My family, they didn't swing with the tongue. They didn't, yo, they didn't swing like this, you guys. But they swung with the tongue. Black belt and tongue food. So anyway, you guys, yep. And so anyway, you guys, I could not believe all these people that showed up at the funeral in Darien. And so now my Jerry Springer siblings, now they're trying to keep me from sharing. They don't want me to speak because I was the only one that had a relationship with my dad. Only one that had a relationship. But see, I said, God, only you can make a way for me to get up there and share before these people to let them know the relationship I had with my dad. So this is 10 years ago, you guys, last Saturday. So guess what? I got up there and I sang the song and I danced and I had a good time. And they stood and gave me a standing ovation. Everyone, I could not believe because the fact is I had a personal relationship with dad. So anyway, you guys, um, and Curtis and all these heart attacks and all that, you guys, you know, and, and money. One thing I found out about money, when it comes to money, in the fourth dimension, is the, is anyone there? Uh-oh, what happened? Kurt, I get the wrong, I'm sorry, you guys, I, uh-oh, uh, uh, hurry, I'm sorry. Uh-oh, uh, I backed it out. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. All right, I hit the, okay, so, when it comes to money, I found out one thing, Rob. Bob, money is the lowest form. It's the lowest form in, in the fourth dimension. And how I got over into the fourth dimension is strictly by grace. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. I'm not here to impose God. I'm here to expose. And so like someone said to me, Norma Jean, would you give it all up for wealth? What you have today? Would you give it all up? I said, give what up? I, I have it all. I have it all. Why would I want to give up power, purpose, promises, provision, protection, passion, presence, peace, perseverance, persistence, persona, position, potential, pizzazz, and permanent recovery? I have it all. So, you know, you know, I, I was shocked that someone would ask me, a, ask me a question like that. Because I cannot cross over into the fourth dimension and brag about my money. But this is, how I, this is what I, I did to get over here. God said, mm -mm. he said, I'm going to be the one that's going to take all the credit. So, you guys, I am so grateful. And eight years ago, y'all not going to believe what happened. This is how we... It's, I've had three born again experiences. BA, born again. I have a PhD, past having doubts. And guess what? I got, when I went to Hawaii 17 years ago, end up staying on extended time on someone else's time. End up buying a condo that was not, <laughs> end up buying a condo that was not uh, even on the market. And the money came from a house that went into foreclosure five times. And so, and not only did we buy the condo, but three, four months before that, we bought a 43 foot diesel pusher motor coach with two bathrooms. He could leave his seat up. He could leave his seat up. So we traveled the nation all together about 20 times carrying the message, north and south and east and west. So anyway, 17 years ago, we got to this international commission in Hawaii, right here, and we ended up buying a condo. Okay, so this 12 coconuts, 12 palm trees, and uh, here it is. It's, it's, it's really a considered a famous meeting because of, here it is. Can you see this? This is, they call it the world's most famous A. A meeting. Can you see it? Yeah. No, you can't see it. No. Oh, there. Oh, you can see it now. Okay. It's 12 
palm trees, 12, in a circle. Because I asked God, I said, how are you going to have me go around the world and speak? i like to know. I want to see you pull that one off. And he sent us to Hawaii. And because it's so uh, such an international meeting, we get 10, 15 visitors a day. Before COVID, 15 a day. Now, it's like, mm, gosh, it's a whole lot more with, you know, on Zoom. And so these people will come from all over the world and they hear me run my mouth in a meeting. And that became my central office. From Australia, all up in Canada. I spoke, I shared, uh, you know, Vancouver and Victoria and New Westminster and the International with Clancy on the same, the same time. Matter of fact, Clancy made his transition for the ones that don't know this past week. And so like anyway, um, and then all into England, all the state, almost all the states, this one particular thing, that's what God used. That was a born again experience for me. All right. You know, and then what happened after that? Now, eight years ago, uh, I went to England, Birmingham to speak at an international convention. And um, I don't know. I just, I said, God, I, you know, I want to do more. I have so much more inside me. Bob, did you spill my drink? <laughs> I have so much more inside me to do other than what I've been doing. <laughs> I said, I love my fellowship, but they sick of me. You know, I'm sick of them, but I love them. I said, because iron, Bob, sharpens iron. I would not be the woman I am today if it was not for my fellowship. Iron sharp is iron. And most of all, the big book and God. God first and then the big book second and, and the fellowship is third. And so I'm in England after I'm sharing. I'm saying, God, I want to do more than what I've been doing. And, and he broke care for it. I heard a voice. Roses. It was a melody. Cruises, 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 cruises. I called Curtis. I said, Curtis, get the packing. We're going on cruises now. Because of, of our promotion, God gave us a great big old promotion on the seven seas ocean that's always in motion. We came on, a, got on the cruises, and God gave us the chapel for the friends of Bill W., Dr. Bob. And, uh, and so, now, the fellowship, first week I walked in the AA, uh, I raised my hand, uh, I told them I'm never going to drink, never going to use. And they, they, kept, they told me to shut up, sit down and listen. Oh, they kept telling me to shut up. And I kept looking in the book, I go back the next day, another meeting, shut up, sit down and listen. He, they thought I was confused, they didn't realize I was infused. So I went back to the meetings. I said, I've been looking all night long, trying to find out where's it telling the newcomer to shut up and sit down and listen. Anyway. So, but in that book, because I, I stayed in the book, it said they took out one night out of the week to let the share or allow anybody and everybody that's willing to grow along spiritual lines to come into the meeting. I said, the first month, because he kept telling me to shut up and sit down and listen. I said, now that's the fellowship I want to go to. I want to, I want, I want that fellowship as well as AA fellowship. And that's the fellowship I found on a cruise. Friends of Bill, I mean, N-A, A-A, C-A, O-A, I-A, G-A, all the maids will show up. And um, somebody said, yeah, I said, you got a problem? Well, yeah, I got a problem with gambling. I said, yep, I used to have one too. I used to love the slot machines. I used to be a slot slut. I said, mm -hmm. sit over there. And then another one said, eh, I got I got a problem with, you know, with infidelity. You know, I can't keep my pants up. I said, well, don't go over there. Just keep keep your zip up. You know, I'll, I'll joke around with them. I said, I had a problem too with infidelity. Okay. See, because of six and seven, I qualified to be in that room with them. Let them know I had these problems too. Six and seven set me free from a lot of the, those demons I had. You know, the shopping addiction I had. Six and seven. I asked God to remove, not to improve. 
And that's what he did. He did. You know, and I, and I just cannot believe it. The credit card addiction, I'm credit free. Credit card addiction free. I, I don't have no, we have no, you know, other than a light bill, you know, insurance. And other than that, I don't, mm -mm, cable. So anyways, okay, anybody, everybody. So anyway, you guys, so we got on the cruise there. Then, then the Spirit spoke to me a year, a, about a year after we got on the cruise. Because I accidentally fell off into a B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving Earth meeting. A Bible study. And I raised my hand in the back, back down towards the end. I said, I can say something here. And when I finished, they asked, the minister said, would you come back and speak for us? I said, mm, no. He said, why not? I, just about to, I was just about to engage my tongue, teeth, and lips and said, because you guys are too judgmental. But I didn't. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm a 12-stepper. And I walked away. Went on my balcony, not a moment of clarity, never turned down a request. I found the guy the next day, and guess what? And I went in that meeting, and I shared my experience, strength, and hope, but I put scripture with those steps, and I presented. And and when I shared I was recovered, they stood up. <laughs> and then they asked me to come back and speak again. The next day, I said, you got other speakers here? Then afterwards, you guys, I, I did it the second time. And I knew then that God wanted me to present because of his consent, his consent to represent alternative steps to church folks. Different the, uh, mayors, I mean, not mayors, but bishops, teachers, preachers, rabbis, ministers. So that's what we do. That's what we was doing for eight years, you guys. So let me tell you the miracle of what happened. This happened two years ago. Here we are at the airport in Honolulu, waiting to get on the flight to head to San Pedro. So we get on a 28 day cruise, going to Bora Bora, all these other islands. And so we're at the airport, I'm telling Curtis, I say, Curtis, let's uh, get out of this line. We're not gonna make the flight. There's a hold up here. And he just totally ignored me. I said, Curtis, let's get out. Oh, we're going to be okay. I said, Curtis, look what time it is. Oh, we're going to be okay. See, we live in a two-story house. His story and my story. So, anyway, I said, Curtis, we got to... We got to the gate. I did stop and got me a sandwich, got some meat. We got to the gate, and it was closing that door. Have, have you ever experienced something like that when they closing that gate, closing the door? They closed the door right in my face. And I ran up on the door, and I started banging on the door, banging on the door, open up, open up. My program fell off the wagon, open up, open up, open up. And some woman walked up to me, and you know what she said to me? She said, why don't you accept the unacceptable? She said, take responsibility. And I looked at her, and you know what I said to her? I came down off that emotional cloud with two horns, Two horns on the top of my head. I had a pitchfork in my hand. And I had a curly tail growing out my butt. And she told me, you know, take responsibility. I looked at her, I said, you, 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 alcoholic. Why don't you go to AA? Because you walk like and talk like one of my people. I I was out of control. I was and I was angry at him. So but what I did though. Hey, I hit the reset button. Oh, I hit that reset. I said, God forgive me. Oh, I said, but she was all in my Kool-Aid and she did not even know the flavor. I said, and here, I told him to get out the line. But forgive me, Lord, forgive me. We went home. And so I said, now I need some peaceful sleep, Lord. I need some peaceful, peaceful sleep. And guess what? He gave it to me. I went to sleep. And then I heard Curtis in the morning. He was talking to the agent and talking to some people on the cruise. And they said to him, okay, yeah, we'll wait for you. And then they said, 
called back and said, no, we can't wait for you. We can't wait for you. By the time you find your luggage, by the time you get Uber, 22 miles to the port, we can't wait for you. And then Curtis said, well, we'll take that $10,000 and, and um, transfer it over to the Christmas New Year's cruise for 28 days. And they said, okay. Then they called back and said, no. You don't have any insurance on that $10,000. I said, travel insurance. I said, it's God's will for us to be on that cruise. Who do I need with travel, travel insurance if it's God's will? They said, no, we're not going to transfer it. Then Curtis said, okay, you guys are coming across the pond. Take you six days to get here so you can stop by and pick us up in Hawaii. Because you headed to Bora Bora. And then they said, okay, maybe we can do that. And then they called back and said, no, we can't do that. A maritime law. We just don't pick up people anywhere. Unless you're going to pay $800 each. Guess what? And then all of a sudden, huh? A voice come in, Bob. A voice from heaven. It, it had to be the captain. He said, we're going to pick you up. We will pick you up. You know, everybody got a track record. Am I right? You got a track record. We had a track record on that, on that cruise. He looked at, he said, that big mouth black chick, you know what I'm saying? He probably said to himself, that big mouth black chick and her husband, troublemakers. <laughs> anyway, we're going to pick them up. We're going to pick you up. We're going to pick you guys up. 74 cruises. Well, you know, 64 cruises at that time. 64 cruises in seven years, we'll pick you up. Took them six days to come across the pond. So when they when they came, you can see at my meeting I just showed you, you can see the, the ship out there, on the ocean, waiting to pick us up. So I told them, I told the group I said look at here, real quick I said look at you guys, five thousand people they came to pick us up. So when we got to the cruise, we walked the plank we got and there was all these bars and caps and stars. And they stood in a line and they shook our hand one by one and said, welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Then we got to our room real quick. And you're not going to believe what happened. When we got to our room, somebody knocked on the door. And it was a, one of the stars and bars and caps and said, guess what? We, here is a box of candy. They dropped off a box of chocolates. And we were invited to three captains' luncheon. Most traveled. Most traveled passengers. Because being in the will of God. The will of God would not take me where the grace of God cannot keep me. Because I'm going to end up by saying, all I did was, I started living the steps. And I got catapulted into that fourth dimension. And um, life is like a coin. You only get to spend it once. And uh, what I did, I spent that coin when I received the Holy Spirit, one, two, and three. I spent that coin when I received the psychic chase, step four, five, six, and seven. And then I spent that coin when I became a part of and set apart from the human race, the third dimension. And 10, 11, and 12, I spent that coin, not only in the world, but I spent that coin in the universe. That's why they called me Norma. James C. So if it is to be, it is up to me. If I don't go within, I will go without. If I don't stand for something, I'll fall for anything. I'd rather be wrong doing something than wrong doing nothing. I don't go along so that I can get along. Because my life is my message and my message is my life. I'd rather try something big and fail than to do absolutely nothing and succeed. Because if I'm wrong about this program, then it doesn't matter what I'm right about. If I have a misunderstanding about this program, then abuse is inevitable. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for the opportunity for living in God's will. And if the mind can conceive it, and if the heart can receive it, the will has achieved it. Norma Jane C. Happy, joyous, and free from Waikiki Beach, Hawaii. Thank you for letting me share.